you've had the opportunity to work with some awesome people. I mean, and to be a part of some awesome collaborations. So tell us about how you actually got hooked up with Prince in the time. With Prince in the past? Well, actually, I got hired to be the lead singer for the time, okay? Mm-hmm. Morris, they was going to be the drummer. Morris and Prince had called me and asked me to have a meeting with them. So I went, we went to this uh, very famous musical restaurant in Minneapolis called Rudolph's, it's a barbecue joint. And uh, okay. we met, and uh, they offered me this job being a lead singer for the time. And uh, so we started to record and and things like that at Prince's house out in Minnetonka. And uh, I started asking questions in reference to the financial aspect of of this venture. And also, (laughs) there was another drummer that was going to be left out of the band named Jelly Bean Johnson, because Morris going to be the drummer, so how could Jelly Bean? Now, we we already had a group in Minneapolis called Flight Time, right? So I worked with the fellows, Terry Lewis, Jimmy Jam, Monty Moyer, Jelly Bean Johnson, myself, a couple other people. And uh, I felt that, you know, we were in a position where we were close to getting a deal ourselves because we were in the studio doing things. And, you know, uh, I, I was questioning them about their decision going to be going on to be the time. Anyway, to make a long story short, I got fired, okay, for opening my mouth, okay, <laughs> for, for talking. I learned a big lesson then, you know, about things. But I guess, you know, Ms. Diamond, my values had already been formed as uh, my morals as a man and the type of man that I wanted to be and the type of person I wanted to be. They were already formed. So, therefore, for me to sit back and to be passive and and not to say anything or not to ask any questions, especially in reference to (laughs) the things that was being required of us, you know, uh, okay. That wouldn't have been okay. Alexander. That wouldn't have been Alexander O'Neill. So consequently, obviously, I guess Prince Bucket taking the attitude that you know, you have you have a hundred percent of nothing, and I'm offering you fifty percent of something. And you have the nerve to question me. Uh, right. Yeah, I do right. have the nerve to question you. Okay. So um, uh, I went to rehearsal one night. The only thing, the getting fired wasn't. A, wasn't the, wasn't the worst part about it because sometimes, Miss Diamond, good things comes out of bad situations. You just have to work it and look for the good things. And so, getting yeah. fired wasn't the worst thing in the world, but it was the way it was done. Okay. Okay. The way it was done, it was certainly very spineless, and I thought it was cowardly. You know, because mm. Prince never told me I was fired. I went out to a rehearsal one night, and he said, we're not going to do out to the session, studio session. He said, we're not going to have a session tonight. Morris and I are going down on First Avenue. And he gave me $50. And from that point on, I was out. Well, I didn't know mm. I was out. At least be man enough to tell me, no, you're not going to work out. We're going to get somebody else to do this. That's the only thing that, you know, kind of bugged me about it. And, uh, it, but, uh, you know, consequently, you know, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, who are members of the time as well, they got fired, you know, uh, really uh, due to, a, you know, one of the few times in Atlanta that it ever snowed, <laughs> okay, it ever snowed. They got <laughs> okay. snowed in, and they had, a, they had a show, I think, in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma the next day, and they missed the show. And Prince was so livid, he was, because he had to play bass behind the curtains, right? He had to play okay. the bass behind the curtain, and the show had to go on. And so, consequently, he fired them. One of the best things that happened mm-hmm. to them as well, because they went on to to perform their uh, producing collaboration, uh, Flight Time mm-hmm. Production with Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, and all the wonderful hits that they that they've written over the years. And uh, you know, they were my friends. They are my friends, and they they, okay. they, they were basically described the epitome of friendship because. You know these guys are. You know, I was doing the club. That's why. That's why I tell people all the time. You gotta be out there. You gotta be performing. You gotta be out there where people can see you. You know, know that you, because you never know who's in the club that night. You never know who's yeah. the, where your opportunities. Never know where your opportunities come from. But because I was very persistent, 
you know why I, I I I was determined. I said after I got fired from Prince, I was determined to get a deal. Now, okay, now I'm gonna I'm, Alexander O'Neill is going to get a record deal. Okay, I know that's uh, right. But, Speaking into existence. But by the grace of God, my friends were in a position. They said they came home and I was doing a local club downtown Minneapolis. Jim and Terry said, look, man, we just started our producing thing. They just did the SOS band. Uh, and uh, their first thing. And uh, so they said, when we get our feet planted firmly on the ground in the industry, then we're going to come back and we're going to get you a record deal. Help mm. you get a deal. And I was like, okay, cool, man, cool. Well, about a year later, that happened. And it's so it's so crazy because, you know, I had given myself 10 years to, uh, actually I decided in 1975 that I was going to be, no more bands. If, if I'm, I'm going to go my way, I'm going to be a solo artist, and that was it. And I gave myself 10 years to get a record deal. And I said, if I don't get a deal in 10 years, I'm going to go to Wisconsin. I'm going to truck driving school. And I'm going to drive oh, a big wow. 18-wheelers. 18 wheelers across the country because I always have felt the guy, I had to be in a job that makes a lot of money. But you work hard, right? But you make a lot of yes, money. Yes, yes. So, right. so I, I I said that was it. And in the 10th year is when I got the deal. So, you know, it's amazing. So, you know, you never know who's in the club. You never know you got to keep going, keep being the best. Because in the local music scene in Minneapolis, St. Paul, we were packing them in. We were packing them in. We were doing like three nights a week, and those three nights we were packing them in to the local band, playing other people's stuff, you know. And plus, I had a, I'd already had a, uh, a a hit in Minneapolis on a local record, a small record company out of Illinois, or shall I say Maryville, Indiana, which is right outside of Chicago, called Erect Records. So in, entitled "Do You Dare" and a, a beautiful ballad called "Playroom," and so okay. I was known in the city. I had already had a stardom, an R&B stardom in the city, because back at that time, there wasn't very many. There was a few records out, but you know, it, it took you had to be pretty daring to put your own record out and stuff like that. And I worked with a good team of guys that we decided that we were going to. We were going to keep going. We weren't going to let anything stop us. And uh, it worked out.